Welcome. I'm Dr. Vinay Prasad. I'm a hematologist oncologist, and I'm associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. In my professional life, I see patients, I teach trainees, and I do research in healthcare policy. This is Plenary Session. Plenary Session is a podcast at the intersection of medicine, oncology, and health policy, and you're listening to season three. On this week's episode... This week on Plenary Session, we got Bernie Marini. Bernie Marini needs no introduction. He is a pharmacist par excellence at the University of Michigan. He's going to talk about ALL drugs. This is back by popular demand. You know, normally every week you hear me say, if you're a fan of this show, go support us on Patreon. You get access to the slides. I got something new to say this time. I think the good old days are over. We're living in a unique time where people are very happy to extinguish voices and ideas that they deem unfit for consumption. And so I personally have gone on Patreon. I've supported a number of people who I listen to, the podcasts that I love, and I'm encouraging you to do the same. The only way we can combat this growing force of illiberalism is to support with our dollar bills podcasts we enjoy. So that's my plug. I'm back in plenary session. This is literally like the 10th time I'm recording this. I'm joined by Bernie Marini. He's a doctor. He's a pharmacist extraordinaire at the University of Michigan, and he's back by listener request. Bernie, it's a pleasure to see you again. It's great to be back on the podcast. I'm, I'm happy to be here. People loved your episode, my friend. People loved it. <laughs> we, had, we had a lot of fun last time. We talked about some, some very interesting drugs, and uh, I think we did a good job you know, picking apart those trials and really diving down into the details. And so hopefully we can do it again. We talked about a lot of game changers. They were game changers when we started, but by the time we were done, they were not changing many games. The game is a new game now. <laughs> it's it a is new crazy. Game. Well, I, um, I want to apologize because we literally recorded 10 times where I butchered your name and your title. You know, I always do this. I always, I always screw it up because it's so difficult. You know, it's so difficult to keep track of, you know, who has a doctorate, who doesn't. Um, you want to call mm-hmm. people the way they prefer to be called. I always stumble over that. I'm, I'm bad with names. I got to admit, I'm bad with names. And then the titles, my friend. Some people got so many titles. The director of the this, that, and the this, that, that. It's too, too much. <laughs> well, we'll keep it simple. You're an oncology pharmacist. You're an extraordinary steward, I think, of cancer therapeutics. And this time, we're talking about ALL. So ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. That's all I know. So that's the show's over. Show's over. No. Yeah, it, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think ALL is uh, the perfect um, area for some of these stewardship initiatives. Um, you know, I think of ALL treatment. Uh, I think it's one of the most exciting but challenging areas because it's probably, you know, the land of the single arm, you know, phase two study with variable outcomes. And so you're going to find very few randomized controlled trials here. And we're going to talk about a couple of them, I hope, today. Um, but this is the place where variation in practice within countries and from country to country differs so significantly, mm. which makes it really hard to compare outcomes in this setting. You know, if you look at a patient treated in Michigan, you know, at, at the University of Michigan, and you compare that to a patient treated at UCSF or a patient treated at MD Anderson, everybody's giving completely different therapies. That's what makes it really, really challenging in the space, but also very exciting to study. I think that's well put. I and, and and I will agree with you. I mean, where are the places that I have seen uh, ALL and taken care of ALL patients secondarily um, on the inpatient service uh, include um, Northwestern University, um, maybe mm-hmm. a little bit out east um, when I was a fellow. Yeah, of course at. Um, I have to think about that a little bit more. Maybe, maybe a hospital center, maybe Hopkins, maybe, and certainly at Oregon Health and Science University. And different providers have different preferences, um, and there's a, a lot of difference in thinking around young adults versus older adults, and what is the age at which you become an older adult, um, and the role of Philadelphia chromosome drugs, targeting drugs, how they should be used. So why don't we just break it out a little bit? So let's say... You know, you have a new ALL yeah. patient come to you, Bernie, um, and they ask you, um, you know, mm-hmm. w- what should I give? Um, why don't you take us through a little bit um, how you think about it? If they're younger than 40, if they're older than 40, 
what are the age cutoffs if you if you prefer something different than forty? What's the Michigan way? How do you how do you guys think about how do you all mm-hmm. think about an ALL patient coming in the door? So I think um, our first bifurcation point is whether or not patients have that Philadelphia chromosome. Sure. So if they're Philadelphia chromosome positive, they're going to get completely different therapy than if they're Philadelphia chromosome negative. Okay. So we can start with Philadelphia chromosome negative. Um, maybe that's easier. Maybe it's not. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think if you're if you're a younger Philadelphia chromosome negative patient, I think these patients um, we would tend to give pediatric inspired therapy to. Right now, what is the exact cutoff of these adolescent, young adult, or AYA patients? I don't think anybody actually truly knows. Um, and I think this is an area where, you know, we don't have a randomized trial that says pediatric inspired therapy is better than adult therapy in this setting, but we have a lot of retrospective studies. Yes, a lot. Uh, um, there's almost, you know, there's like 30 um, across oh, yeah. multiple different countries comparing these peds inspired regimens to adult inspired regimens. So, so we would give a pediatric inspired regimen in that setting. And, and, and if I were to summarize these retrospective studies, I think it would be fair to say that they yes. show um, that patients treated in the hands of or receiving a pediatric regimen do better than those treated with an adult regimen. Um, but the challenge, of course, is that those are not the, those aren't the same people. Uh, they're often at different centers with different expertise right. in different geographic locations. If you're closer to a um, quaternary hospital, you're more likely to have somebody there who has trained in AYA. And then the other thing is they have to be hearty enough to receive it because the AYA regiments are, you know, correct me if I'm mm-hmm. wrong, but they're 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 a stiff drink. They're stronger. They're stronger stuff. And so all these selection biases are going into this. Going into this. Fair to say. Yeah, I think I think that's a huge point. Um, someone made the decision to take that person to a pediatric hospital instead of an adult hospital, or right. they showed up themselves to a pediatric hospital or an adult hospital, right? And so I think you know not only are there differences in the treatment regimens, where the pediatric regimens we said they were fit enough to get a pediatric regimen, there's also differences in the socioeconomic factors that play into this. You know, if you're 18 years old and you're a college kid on your own, you don't have as many resources as someone that's, you know, maybe living with their parents and their parents have good social support. I think one is maybe more likely to be treated at a PED center than an adult center. I think there are a lot of factors that play into outcomes in these AYA patients more than just the biology of disease and in the regimens that we choose. And so there is a huge selection bias that plays into these comparisons. I think the the challenging thing is there's there's such a stark difference in outcomes. It's, it's hard not to buy into this AYA regimen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I think in the, you know, if you have a young fit patient, it's not as big of a clinical decision to say, I'm going to treat you on a pediatric inspired protocol as when we get into these older patients, when we start to bleed into the 30 year olds, the 40 year olds, the 50 year olds, where's, where's the cutoff? Um, at what point is pushing more and more asparaginase in these patients actually improving their outcomes or causing toxicity. That's the space where I think we need a randomized trial for sure, because otherwise we're, we're never going to know. Um, so I think, I I think that's a a huge unknown right now. I agree with you a lot. I I think you, um, I think, I think you're right. You have equipoise for randomized trial. And if I were to say where it should go, I'm going to put my cards on the table and I say it should be 30 to 40, uh, over or over 30, 30 to 50. That should be the randomization. And you can have enough power to look at subgroups by 30 to 40 and 40 to 50. Um, if I were to bet, I'll bet it's going to be negative that these pediatric regimes don't have a benefit. That's my bet. And then I bet if you take it the next step and you go down a notch 25 to 30, I'm putting a question mark there. I'm in total equipoise, but if I were a betting person, I have my bets. And then 20 to 25, I think you might see the pediatric regimens eke things out. Um, take us through. So you got, let's say we've got, um, you know, a 27 year old, 27 year old ALL patient, Philly negative. Um, which regimen do you like? Which one are you guys going to go with in Michigan? So we, um, we, we generally ultimately choose the CALGB 10403 regimen, which is the, the Alliance trial. Mm-hmm. Um, this is, this is that Dono, was a pediatric Vinca, inspired regimen in Red. the United States. I see. Go on. Yep. A- so in, induction is typically f- four drug induction of anthracycline, mm-hmm. 
weekly anthracycline and vidcrystine, steroids, and asparaginase therapy. However, at Michigan, we love to be weird. And um, <laughs> um, for better or for worse, um, we've studied a lot on, on how to optimize asparaginase therapy and reduce toxicities. So one of the things that we do is we slightly modify the induction of 10403. We actually give our induction to look more like the traditional Larson. Wow, we just uh, interrupted for a few minutes while Zoom fucked up again. Zoom is a worthless, worthless commodity. Um, okay, we're back. We're back. We're back. We're going to keep my insulting of Zoom in there. Um, Bernie, I was asking you. Okay, so you were just saying, okay. you're just saying we got... Um, yep young adult, Philly negative, you follow CLGB 10403, but you modify it. So tell us about that modification. Yeah, we, we do some modifications and mostly it's because if you look at that 10403 paper, the rate of hepatotoxicity is really high, especially in induction with pegasparagine. And I think there's a couple reasons for this. And this is where a lot of our research is in, is in how do we predict patients for toxicity? And can we do any, anything about it? So one of the things that we've started to do is delay the asparaginase until day 15. So after that time period, you know, they've recovered their counts. They've got over any neutropenic complications that have happened. And then you can hit them with the drug that's going to blow up their liver. If you do it on day four, that is literally the worst time to give that drug in terms of hepatotoxicity and worsening outcomes. So that's probably the biggest modification that we make. We also do some changes with dosing of pegasparaginase. Um, we do therapeutic drug monitoring with that drug. It's probably an entire discussion on its own on how we monitor asparaginase and how we dose it in older, more unfit patients or patients who have risk factors. So let's say this patient came to us and they had a really, really high BSA, you know, like a BSA of two and a half. Um, there's some Michigander patients that we have that have very high BSAs. Obesity is a, a big problem in, in the Midwest. Um, those patients are at very high rate of hepatotoxicity. So we'd actually dose reduce to a thousand units per meter squared, mm, wow. um, which is what they do in a lot of the UK protocols. Mm -hmm. And, and actually you probably only need two weeks of asparagine depletion. Mm -hmm. If you look at, you know, the original E. coli versus pegylated E. coli asparaginase trials, yes. they only depleted asparagine for about two, two and a half weeks. I see. If you were to substitute with Erwinia, you'd only be depleting for two weeks. I see. If you give 2,000 units per meter squared uncapped to a, a person with a BSA of two and a half, they're going to have asparaging depletion for a month, over a month. I see. But and so, so if you have any toxicity, yeah. you're, you're done. You're not going to get much consolidation. So CLGB 1043, like so many great studies, has no control arm. Am I right about that? It's, <laughs> yeah. Okay, right. I didn't want to say it, but yeah, there is no control. There's no control, control arm. Yeah. Um, and there is a, a nice uh, subtle callback to uh, a historical comparator mm -hmm. who got adult inspired therapy and, and they said, yeah, it's better than adult inspired therapy. Yeah. That's, but, that's silly. Um, okay. Again, let's, you're right. Let's, let's put that aside. Okay. Yeah. So it is, um, it, but it's an AYA patient study. That's what makes it notable. It's an AYA patient, 17 yeah. to 39. It, um, and, and yeah. just to go through the, like, it's very complicated. I mean, course one is, you it's know, very, very, com okay. So you're, you agree. Um, Hold on a second. You get it's very complicated. Basically, to kind of sum it up, it's a number of different drugs yes. that are active in ALL. It's a two-year treatment course. Yes. The major difference between the PEDS inspired and adult inspired is the amount of asparaginase therapy that is in it. So in 10403, there's it's 2500. Yeah, it's 2500. 2500. So the dose is high. That's number one. Okay. And I don't agree with that dose. But number two, the other issue is it's the amount of depletion you get over time. Dosing doesn't quite as matter as much as how much, how many doses you get, right? Um, in Larson, they also gave a, a fairly hefty dose, but you only give it two or three times. With 10403, you get, you know, up to eight doses of asparaginase in the regimen. So that's kind of the biggest change from the adult inspired to the pediatric inspired protocols. I see. Um, and I mean, if you were to articulate the justification for your change is basically pharmacologic. I mean, it's, it's that you believe it will have better pharmacologic properties. Fair to say? There's some data. So we, we borrow from the Dan Dewar's study um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and it's, I think, the current USC protocol, where they delay pegasparaginase until day um, 15, 16. 
Okay. And their rates of hepatotoxicity are, are exceedingly low. The UK does the same thing. So a lot of the UK adult protocols, they omit the initial dose and wait until around day 15 or day 22 to give the dose. Okay. So a lot of these protocols are moving it to later. In terms of the dosing of high dose versus 1,000, again, we borrow that from a lot of our European colleagues, which are no longer using these high doses. They're in general using doses of 1,000 units per meter squared for a lot of these patients. Okay. And so now tell me about over the age. Not of everybody. Yeah. Okay, now tell me about over the age of 40. So if you're young, fit, yeah. Well, if you're over the age of 40, you use Larson. this is where I think there's really no standard. Okay. We use Larson. Um, which, which is CLGB 8811. Right, right. But if you have somebody who's super fit and is in that 45 age range up to 50, we'd think about an AYA protocol on those patients oh, too. Oh, gosh. But if they're biologically oh, and older, we would give 8811 or, or Larson therapy in those patients, unless they're very fit. And then we'd consider pediatric inspired in them as well. So the Larson regimen also has a vinca. It also has an anthracycline. It also has prednisone. Um, mm -hmm. and it, it, and, and, and you're using L asparaginase there instead of peg asparaginase. No. So currently the only, um, we don't have the, the native E. coli asparaginase on the market anymore. We only have the pegylated version, um, Erwinia asparaginase, which is derived from another bacteria. Uh, and then another pegylated product with a super long half-life that um, is pretty useless. <laughs> okay, what's that That's called? That's a topic for another day. What's that called? It's called uh, Cal Aspergase Pegol or Calpeg. I don't, I don't know what the okay. brand is, but it's okay. useless. No that, one, no one should ever use it. I see. So, which asparaginase are you using? You're using peg asparaginase, then also peg, peg asparaginase. Okay. Yep. okay. Yep. Um, yep. And and. And, 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 and so, so I mean, so what, what is the fundamental differences here? The dosing is slightly different. The dosing is the, the fundamental dose, the, the fundamental difference between a regimen like Larson yeah. and an AYA based protocol is the amount of asparaginase that they get over their two year period. Okay. So if you look at Larson, you're only going to get two or three doses of asparaginase total okay. in the regimen. If you look at other adult inspired regimens like hyper CVAD, you get zero. Um, actually that's not quite true because now they've added it in maintenance, but it's only a couple doses. Um, but if you look at a peds regimen, you know, you could be looking at up to a dozen doses and 10403, this peds inspired therapy gives, I think seven doses of pegylated asparaginase throughout the course. That's the major difference in terms of, um, a different, like the major change to the regimen compared to the adult inspired protocols. Now, my understanding with asparaginase is the central principle is that this particular type of leukemic cell is very dependent on manufacturing its own asparagine. Mm -hmm. And so what you want to do is, is you want to take away the ability for cells in the body to manufacture their own asparagine. Um, and leukemic cells, of course, um, are preferentially dependent on that mechanism of uh, for survival. Um, yep. Okay, that's accurate. So then um, if that is the case... My question to you is, why is ALL particularly, uh, uh, why does it use this pathway, you know, you know, why don't we talk about asparaginase and many, many other cancers? Why is it this cancer? Yeah. And then, um, and, and, uh, okay, go on. Yeah, let's just start there. So first, um, ALL cells and, and lymphoblast cells, they lack um, an enzyme called asparagine synthetase. I see. That takes other amino acids and converts them into asparagine. Okay. And so for the rest of our cells in our body, we have that enzyme. Okay. And so we can synthesize asparagine from other amino acids. But because ALL cells lack that, they're dependent on endogenous um, asparagine for survival. And so if we cleave all the asparagine in the patient's body, to aspartic acid and ammonia, we're basically starving the leukemia. Cell. I see. Oh, okay, no, I got it back. So they're not right. They're not synthesizing the asparagine. They can't synthesize. So I yeah. said I said it wrong. Bernie, you so, should have corrected yeah, I mean, me. It's, no, it's I said it wrong. It was, it was close. It was close. Close. Close is no good. All right. So yeah, you're right. That's it. That's it. So they they cannot synthesize the asparagine. So they're dependent on exogenous asparagine. They have to take it up and utilize it that way. And what you're doing is you're delivering an enzyme that will cleave it all throughout the body, so that there is very low levels of of asparagine in the, in the circulation, in the system. And so they will die as a result. Exactly. Exactly. So then let me ask you this, but why, why is it the lymphoblast that they can't synthesize this and other cells can? 
it's because of that lack of that enzyme. But why do so they you, lack it? Why? What happened to them? <laughs> I don't know biologically why okay. why they lack that enzyme. And then my follow up um, is why is the question. toxicity of the liver? So I think any cell or any I guess biologic process that depends heavily on protein synthesis, you probably need those amino acids rapidly available. So even though you know our other cells can synthesize asparagine, um, it seems like a lot of um, things that really depend on protein synthesis. So the liver, the pancreas, um, other things like, um, so that's why you get hepatotoxicity, you can get pancreatitis, you can get worsened hyperglycemia on this drug. You deplete all of your natural anticoagulants and clotting factors on this drug. So uh, it essentially induces with. like a DIC like picture, right? That so all I'm these proteins with, yeah. that, that need asparagine, all of that will be decreased. So it's not perfectly um, targeted towards lymphoblast cells, and there are some some toxicities. But I think what's interesting is it's it's probably a threshold drug, right? You only need a certain level of enzymatic activity I see. to have no asparagine in the serum. I see, right. You don't right. need to hit these super, super high levels. With a big peak and, and a big valley, and then you have a valley where, right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, hmm. and that's kind of the concept between giving these lower doses maybe um, continuously versus just like one massive dose that depletes them for a month. Um, no one really knows what the optimal duration of depletion is after one dose. That's a completely unanswered question. Now, what if I gave, and I've never done this and I'll never do this, but what <laughs> if somebody were to give a patient with CLL um, pegasparaginase, what will happen? So I think, um, I, I don't know that CLL cells yeah. um, they, lack they, that enzyme. I see. Okay. There, some of the early studies in the 19, so they actually discovered asparag asparaginase in the 1920s okay. um, in guinea pig serum. So there's a study by oh, Clementi right. and colleagues. It has, yeah. There's some reason, there's th some part of the guinea pig name has been added to, okay, go on, go on. Yeah, I, I think so I heard this, yeah, go on. It, and so they they were, I think they were trying to like grow cells in different culture and you know nothing grew, grew in guinea pig serum because it was cleaving all the asparagine in the serum. I see. Um, and then what they did is they injected this guinea pig serum into mice with, with lymphoma. I believe they were lymphoid tumors yeah, and they don't yeah. specify whether these are like ALL right. cells versus lymphomas. Right. So could it have some, right. you know, large cell lymphoma activity? Maybe. Um, but, you know, we've got all kinds of other things for lymphoma, you know, Selenexor, Colletuzumab, <laughs> all these other, we don't need asparaginase oh too. <laughs> Underpowered face. Okay. All right. Well, that's more, that's more, that's more my, my favorite topic to discuss. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So come yep. back to this. Okay. So, so what you're saying is I see point well taken. So, so, um, uh, under 40, um, you're using, you're using the C, you're using the Wendy stock paper, the, the one Oh four three, um, over exactly. 40, you're using the Larson, Larson data, uh, 8811. Mm -hmm. Um, the central difference here is, um, when they're older, they can't tolerate as much asparagine depletion, uh, asparagine yep. depletion. Okay. Fair enough. Okay, now take us to the Philly positive. Okay, so now in the Philly positive realm, um, there's there's data that um, again this is not randomized data, um, but adding the TKI to regimens significantly improved outcomes in these patients compared to historical controls, which were abysmal in pH positive patients with ALO. And so mm -hmm. for a young pH positive patient, like an AYA patient. Yes. I think this is another area of controversy because we're, we're suddenly all believing in these AYA regimens being the, the greatest thing. Right. Um, but we don't know what TKI to optimally choose with it. You know, should we pair imatinib with it? Should we pair disatinib with it? Should we pair punatinib oh, gosh. Know, with these BF? Oh gosh, is right. Right. Yeah. Um, but, I, but we but have but no, I, yeah, I hear the argument no for disatinib data. is the CNS penetration. What do you think about this? It, it does have higher CNS penetration yeah. than imatinib, um, but you're giving so much intrathecal therapy and right. CNS-directed therapy, <laughs> I, I don't think the choice of TKI yeah. matters that much. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, and, and what's the so, rationale for panatinib? You want to, you want to increase blood clot risk even more? What's, what's the rationale there? <laughs> uh, it's more potent, and in some of these patients who relapse um, on second-gen and first-gen TKIs, some will have the T315I uh, mutation sure. and they are sensitive to panip. So sure. the gatekeeper. Um, MD yeah. Anderson probably has the most data of in adult patients of chemo plus TKI. And of course, none of these have been compared. 
but we have data for hyper-C-vadinomatinib, hyper c satinib and hyper c panatinib And progressively, which with each study, you know, over the 20-year period, um, outcomes have looked better with hyper c and panatinib compared to hyper c and desatinib. Um, now, they actually there, did a per- yeah. yeah. Isn't there one? There is a ran- Isn't there one randomized study with uh, the addition of a of a of a BCR able targeted agent and or not? No, <laughs> not in a, adults. Not in adults. Not in adults. Is there one in um, kids? I don't think there is in kids either. Um, there, if you look at some of the data for like desatinib, yeah, um, it was a single arm study, and the conclusion study, was it? that hmm. outcomes weren't any better than when they used to give a matinib. Um, oh, okay. So th- there's, yeah, I, I, there may have been one that I couldn't find um, in my literature search over the years or haven't thought about it. Um, but in adults, we don't have randomized data. We've got hyper CVAD and desatinib in a, in a propensity score match study my compared to hyper CVAD mm-hmm. panatinib mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. by Sasaki and colleagues. Okay. Okay. Um, and they suggest survival is better with the, the third gen TKI. Whatever, whatever you, oh, of course, whatever, whatever area, whatever area pharmaceutical yeah. wants, they, we'll find. Okay. Okay. Well, I put, I'll put zero. I put literally, no, I will put zero <laughs> stock into that, into that study. Okay, good. Okay. So we don't know. Okay. Basically, we don't, we don't know. know. But let me ask but, you. Okay. So tell me, so tell me um, your AYA, what are you giving? What's the, what's the backbone you're giving? And then, and then over 40, what are you going to give? So hyper C bed over 40. AYA, I would say this is a huge debate at our institution. I think our institution is split between giving a BFM regimen like 104.03 okay. with desatinib. And the other half is split between giving hyper C bed and panatinib or desatinib. These young patients can tolerate the third gen TKI. Gotcha. And the outcomes look best in that single arm phase two study compared to the other single arm phase two study. Of course they do. It's um, also newer, so that helps. Um, it's also newer. What about right? what dose of panatinib are you giving? You're not giving the 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 whopper. No. You're not giving forty. No, you're not, you're not, Twenty or thirty. So so they get um I believe in the trial they gave forty five for two weeks. No, that's the whopper. Um and then they back it off to thirty and then they back it off to fifteen, 15 later. So yeah, that's right. 15. Um there's a good paper actually by one of our former pharmacy residents, Caitlin Rausch, who's doing a great job at MD Anderson. Um, she published a paper on basically how do you do hyper C mm-hmm. Um so I recommend anybody who uses hyper C in the community check this paper out because it details what doses of all the TKIs they use how they sequence these therapies. And, and, and essentially, because hyper has changed so much from the original publication in, in the 2000s to now, it's important to look at that because if you look at an early publication, you're not doing what the current iteration is. Mm, I see. Okay. So we will try to add to the show notes a link to this. Um, a link to this. Um, yeah, I can send you the link. Yep. But to be fair, I mean, if you had a... Um, a Philly negative patient with ALL mm-hmm. and they're over the age of 40, arguably you can give hyper CVAD as well. Arguably you could. Yeah. And there's for the older adults, there's, there's no, um, I have no data to say one is better than another. I think hyper CVAD is easier. Yes. It's much easier. Um, That's what I think. It's much less complicated, right? Right. Yes. I think, I think a lot of us who believe in asparaginase and st- study asparaginase mm-hmm. selfishly, mm-hmm. Um, you know, we we tend to believe in that AYA data. And so if someone is younger and fit, but they're over 40, we tend to go for the asparaginase-based regimen over the hyper based regimen. But honestly, there's no data to say that one approach is better than the other. And now with these novel therapies, which I'm sure we'll talk about next. Yeah, that's what we're coming um, to. Does it even matter? Okay. Rituximab plus or minus, when do you do it? We do rituximab for anyone who is CD20 positive. Sure. Um, and that's based on a French study by Maury in New England Journal of Medicine. Yeah. Um, that looked at the addition of rituximab. And interestingly, and, and in that's that study, randomized. That's randomized, isn't that it? That is. That is. That is. I, can, I know this Maury study. Okay. Thank you, Europeans. <laughs> <laughs> so, wait, let me pull this up because it's been a while since I've looked at this. Um, what I think is interesting about this data, if I remember correctly, um, yes. Patients in the rituximab arm had less asparaginase reactions. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that can happen with asparaginase is you can develop uh, antibodies to the drug, which is one of the reasons why, you know, at Michigan, we're studying a lot of this therapeutic drug monitoring. Um, And if you develop antibodies to the drug, you can completely inactivate the drug. 
And if you think this drug is the one thing that's improving your outcomes um, and you have an, an antibody to it, potentially it's not working and you would need to switch to a different asparaginase preparation. And yeah. so in the study of rituximab that depleted B cells, potentially their rate of reactions to rituximab was considerably lower. I see. Oh, so I think at, at Ash, when this was, so one of the potential yeah. mechanisms is that's preventing you from doing autoantibodies. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, the other drug where you often develop antibodies to the drug is, um, is Moxie, Moxie Tumumab for hairy cell leukemia. And you know this one, yeah. it's got the pseudomonal toxin on the end. Yeah. <laughs> you also Don't often, use it a lot, but yeah. Yeah, you probably, it's probably not on your goat. It's not, it's not on your speed dial of drugs, probably. No. Moxie's not your speed dial. <laughs> probably people <laughs> listening are like, is that a drug? Yeah, so it's moxitumumab, um, mm -hmm. pseudo, pseudotox. Pseudotox. Pseudotox, yep. yeah, which is a, um, basically a, a, a drug uh, antibody conjugate, um, but the conjugate is the pseudomonal toxin. And, and anyway, mm. if it, 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 it has some tiny role in, relapse refractory hairy cell but you know of course with hairy cell we have many other hair first of all hairy cell is not that common and you have other drugs so by the time you get to this you know you're, yeah. you're down the road so this mori study this is a randomized control trial rituximab uh plus or minus rituximab for cd20 all um and it shows you know efs benefit os benefit um mm -hmm. kind of the classic thing you see you know, uh, there's that old slogan of rituximab where hope and CD20 are found. And here <laughs> and here you have both hope and CD20. And so it works. It has that increase in plateau. Yeah, um, so this is this is good data, I think. Yeah, um, and it data. definitely supports its use. It's a it's a lamp post in a sea of darkness. Um, OK. <laughs> OK. So so now let's come to the new drugs. You know, we've been we've been talking sure. a little bit about background. We get a sense of it. I think in the community, I think hyper CVAD is often given because of convenience and because no one has ever proven it is inferior mm -hmm. no one's proven that you can think that but you haven't proven it um it's true what about what about the the game changers and by game changers you know what i mean bernie i do blin o <laughs> blin and i know our favorite know. our favorite drugs <laughs> let's talk about um, it. which one should we do first? let's do i know first because i know i think is sure. easier to bash into bits <laughs> that sounds good. So inotuzumab, or, or INO as we like to call it, uh, is a, a monoclonal antibody directed against CD22 on B cells, mm -hmm. which is expressed in about 80% of ALL cells ballpark. Um, and it's attached to a potent chemotherapy agent, ozogomycin. Just like gemtuzumab, the same just payload. Like, ex exactly, the same payload. Same payload. Yeah. So this, this payload is very potent. And once it gets inside the cell and, and the, it gets in the, the lysosomes in that acidic pH, it's released mm. um, and then causes double stranded break. So it's a very potent chemo um, drug attached to this antibody. So just like gemtuzumab, the major side effect here, if you can guess it, is VOD. Oh, yes. Um, so just like gemtuzumab, very similar side effect mm -hmm. because they have that same potent chemotherapy payload. Oh, yes. But so, luckily, you have defibrotide to save us from. <laughs> luckily, we're you know, going to spend a cool, cool, you know, half mil or so and throw some defibrotide prophylactically, prophylactically. at it as well. well yeah, prophylactic. maybe, maybe at the end of this, we can talk a little bit about the data for defibrotide and why we chuckle so much because it's yeah. really very expensive and very poor data. Okay. Yeah. So, so, um, and actually, just a quick question on the side. Do you actually use defibrotide there? We, we do um, for, for true... VOD. Okay. I would say at our institution, VOD is very rare oh, yeah. right. um, because we don't use a lot of vinatuzumab or gemtuzumab, and we don't use a lot of dual alkylator conditioning regimens. So sure. our rate is very, very, very low. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, let's come back to this. Okay. So so yeah. this is this is INO. This is mm -hmm. uh, the INOVATE study, Hagup's yep. Contharjan study. Um, yep. New England Journal paper 2016. Um, when you look at it closely, it looks like there's a uh, there's an OS benefit to I know versus standard therapy. So why don't you walk us through uh, when you look at it when you look at it quickly? Why don't, why don't you walk us yeah. through this paper and look at it a little more deeply? Yeah. So so when you look at it quickly, I, I agree. You know, it looks amazing. Yeah. Eighty percent response rate, survival benefit. You know, game changer, right? Um, but to kind of break it down, so this trial randomized patients to inotuzumab versus standard chemo. And again, just like our previous discussion on AML, the standard chemo options here are not ideal. So the options they gave um, patients and, and providers and, and physicians were FLAG, 
Cytarabine continuous infusion plus mitoxantrone. Can't say I've ever given that what for the f- three no. months. <laughs> Never. Uh, and high DAC. Uh-huh. So those were your three options. Most people chose just straight up flag, mm-hmm. but this is probably not what we do in practice. Yes. In practice, if if you know you came from the community and you came to U of M after getting hyper CVAD, I would probably treat you with something like Larson. You yes. know, a BFM regimen with asparaginase. Um, multiple drugs or something like the UK ALL R3 regimen. So I would use something like that, not just flag. That's relying very heavily on just high dose cytarabine in ALL. Wait, so tell me UK ALL R3, what's, 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 which one? This is the MRC? Uh, so no, that's the, the ECOG. That's the ECOG. Uh, 2993. Yeah, that's, that's 2993. Okay. So which, what's, yeah. what's this one? What's this one? So R3 uh-huh. is, um, I mean, it's sort of like giving Larson, but instead of giving, uh, the, the anthracycline, you're giving mitoxantrone. Oh, okay. Um, so essentially mm. it's yeah, steroid mitoxantrone yeah. instead of, you know, doing Dono or Ida. I see. Then Christine and yeah. PEG. And PEG. So it's a PEG based, gotcha. it's, a, uh-huh, it's what we call uh-huh. a BFM regimen. Uh-huh. Um, that's what we would do for those patients. And, 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 and the reason you're switching the mitoxantrone, the, the Dono or the mitoxantrone, what's the reason? Uh, you know, we love these, um, theoretical benefits yeah. us, uh, pharmacists, but, yeah. <laughs> um, mitoxantrone being an anthracene dione, yes, uh, potentially yes. is not a PGP substrate. So one of the major mechanisms uh-huh, uh-huh. of resistance is to anthracyclines yeah. is their efflux out. Exactly. Yes, so yes. mitoxantrone is not efflux out. Uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, in this uh. trial, this UK ALL R3 trial yeah. actually compared, I believe it was mitoxantrone to Ida. And there was a benefit in terms of survival and giving these relapse. These were pediatric patients. Yeah. Um, mitoxantrone instead of idrubicin. I see. Well, it's Ida. Um, and uh, and and. Uh, but Bernie, tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, didn't didn't a yeah. while back people people investigated um, uh, the e- efflux plump pump inhibitors themselves, PGP inhibitors, didn't we? they've been evaluated in a lot of settings. Um, it's actually some of my research is oh, involved yeah. in the in vitro side and looking at in brain tumor patients. Yes. Um, right. Can yes. we get higher CNS penetration yes. if we use PGP inhibitors? Um, so yeah, they've been studied in, you know, I countless see. settings and but, mostly but are negative. No PGP inhibitor approved to date to my knowledge. No, there's okay. not. There's, okay. there's one called Alacridar or Lacrador that um, it, never made it to uh, development, but well, technically you could give like, there's a lot of drugs that inhibit PGP that you could yes. give. Um, well, but you, yeah, nothing's, you know out. what they say about a cancer drug that hasn't made it to development. You know what they say? They say, <laughs> what do they say? Wait, wait five years and apply again. Cause the bar will fall. <laughs> 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 the bar good... will, the bar will be a little bit lower to to, uh, no, <laughs> sorry, not to delete that to Vosinib, It's, it's your day any day now. No, the bar is always any lower day. in the future. And, 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 uh, the Farnesyl transferase inhibitors, they're coming, they're coming. I know they're coming. Okay. Okay. So let's come back to this. Okay. So, so one fault of this study, this is relapsed ALL patients. They're getting the CD 22 antibody payload conjugate versus standard of care therapy. That is beneath your standard of care. Fair to say. Yep. I think that's what we say. all agree. The next yep. thing, what's the next thing? There's, there's some other problems. So some other problems that I see, um, you know, these are pretty selected patients. They're in first or second relapse only. Mm -hmm. Um, And their response definitions are a little bit tricky here. Um, So normally when we, when we uh, classify response in leukemia, we have complete remission, which is, you know, less than 5% blast and you recover your ANC and you recover your platelets. Sure. And then we have complete remission with incomplete count recovery, which If you look at the actual Chesson criteria, yeah. you had to recover at least one of platelets or ANC. Correct. You can't have nothing right. recovered. This is That's CR, called... IHR, incomplete hem- hematologic yeah. recovery. Right. Okay. Right. MLFS is when you recover nothing. Yeah. Right. So in this study, they called CR, they called it CRI, but it's actually morphologic leukemia free state because it was, you know, if they had less than 5% blast, but didn't recover anything, they still call them CRIs. So I, I wonder if that's why the CRCRI rate looks so high with inotuzumab. Oh, I it see. So so 8%. this is this is not Chesson. This is like modified Chesson. This is like we misinterpreted or to an and, and or. <laughs> I've never. Right? So it's and or. I, I didn't this know study. this. This is ridiculous. Um, yeah. What's the reason it's for a, this? I don't know. I, I think it's, I mean, it's really hard to find these things. Like we've, you know, when we're doing studies retrospectively, <laughs> not that those are the best studies, but um, we work with what we have. Um, we try to, you know, stick to the criteria and trying to find these criteria is very challenging. And you're starting to see a lot of modifications to it, like CRH, 
Yes. Like when you have half count recovery yes. or now they're calling MLFS marrow CR because it sounds better, right? Yes. Oh, you just had a marrow CR, you know, marrow you didn't CR. have a full CR. And what's that other thing so, they did in, um, in, uh, in echelon, what do they call it? Modified PFS. Oh, modified, modified PFS. Modified right? PFS. What the and what the and and, and 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 that included. Oh, uh, I know what it is. It, it if you ended treatment, you radiated something, and yeah. you didn't know what the fuck it was. That's it was modified PFS event. Oh my god. Yep. Yep. If you radiated, yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so back to this. So oh, so, so one so an excellent point. Okay. So so yeah. that also makes cross trial comparisons difficult. It's a slightly different yep. definition. Um, and yep. that might be exactly why it's so high. Okay. It yep. may, I wonder it's so high. And then yet the survival so outcomes high. are not consistent with that high. Yeah. And, and I think breaking it down is interesting. If you look at the people who got, yeah. if you look at these CR, CRI rates, 80% versus 29%, right. Ooh. But 13 patients in the standard chemo arm declined treatment, probably because they were offered garbage and they said, no, thanks. See you later. Um, and they didn't stay on the trial. So, so you, you know, you know, um, we published, uh, I mean, this point is an excellent point. Um, we published that paper in the European Journal mm -hmm. of Cancer on censoring imbalances. And you note, when you look at this curve on the overall survival, for instance, at the first time point, they show you the number of people at risk. It's like yeah. 30 people less than the other arm. If you got assigned to the control arm, um, even though the survival is roughly the same. And so what happens is there is a phenomenon, a very, an early dropout, uh, censoring, uh, uh, early dropout phenomenon on control arm where people are disappointed in what they were assigned and so they drop out of the study and you can see that in our study and you can see some noted outliers um one of the outliers was quizartinib you know quizartinib okay. the yeah yep. they didn't approve yep. it because it was it's so unreliable some of these pfs yeah. estimates when there's such imbalances in censoring okay go on so you're saying okay That's one point here is people are dropping out like yeah. bananas in the control arm obviously yeah. because i mean let me ask you if you were to give a relapsed all patient you saw um a larsen regimen um, what kind of CR, CRI, CRH rate, um, sorry, CR, CRI rate are you going to see in your practice? So we, we've looked at this. Ours is about 40 to 50%. But it ain't so 29%. It's not, it's not 29%. <laughs> right, okay. Um, so it's, it's a bit higher than that. Okay. Um, and I think it depends on the patient when they relapse. I mean, there's so many different factors that go into this. And I think that's what makes ALL challenging is there's so many different different types of relapses and timing of relapses that that's what makes it hard. Gotcha. But anyway, back to these numbers, Yes, 80 versus, so if you pull those patients out, which, you know, they probably shouldn't be in this analysis. Um, it's like an 80% versus like 33%, still not much different. The other thing that's interesting is if you gave somebody flag for relapse ALL, would you give another round of flag? Like, oh, flag didn't work. I still have some disease. I'm going to give flag again. <laughs> most likely no, right? <laughs> no. So most patients in the standard arm got <laughs> one cycle versus in the INO group, a lot of people got a second cycle of INO. Oh. Only 70% of them responded after one cycle. So if you just oh. look after cycle one, which is uh -huh. the real comparison, otherwise in the, in the standard arm, oh. you should look at, you know, yes. chemo regimen one, chemo regimen two, yes. and compare that, right? Yes. If you look at that, it's like a 58% versus 30% comparison. Yes. And that 58%, half of that is CRIs, which oh, we don't know okay. if they're real CRIs yes, or just or, this MLFS. Or MLFS, you're right. So you're looking oh. at about the same numbers. Right, and right. It's, it's not that much different. Uh-huh. Okay, excellent points, excellent points. Okay, okay. So, so right off the bat, you're not convinced that this is a more potent, uh, a more potent leukemia killer than the standards that you would deploy. And you've made yeah. that case, I think, in a couple ways. One, by arguing that they're using substandard chemotherapy, which I think is probably the case. Second, by arguing that there is an attrition that is way higher than you'd expect, and that's in part because they know they're 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 headed for substandard chemotherapy. They know their assignment. Um, third, mm -hmm. that it's lower than what you see when you give stronger regimens. And fourth, that they're not giving a second dose of the chemo, and nor would you. And so it's kind of an unfair comparison comparison, two doses of the new drug versus one dose of an older regimen. Um, so those are all the way. And if you look at apples and apples, one dose of new drug, one dose of older drug, they're actually quite closer. Um, mm -hmm. Putting this all together. Um, um, <laughs> survival. And, and, survival. <laughs> it, it, survival puts it all together. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. So go on. Let's talk about survival. Yeah. So median overall survival in this trial was not statistically different because their primary outcome was split between response rate, the CRCRI rate, and overall survival. 
You know, and, Bernie, uh, I, I, I was telling this to so many people. I was like, they're yeah. like, oh, p-value 0.04. I was like, that's <laughs> not significant because this I they know. have split their fucking alpha. You don't even see. And and it's so misleading, I think. It should say that I on know. the... Oh. I know. Yeah. It, it, and I think they tried to kind of, you know, yeah. make up for this by doing this rest- restricted mean survival oh, time analysis. Started. But I mean, at the end of the day, the median survivals were 7.7 months versus 6.7 months. Mm. So m- maybe, probably not a month. Game changer. No, thanks. No, no thanks. Um, what do you make of somebody will push back Bernie and they're going to say, and I, I know what you're going to say, but so I'm just going to, I'm going to give you the, give you the softball. They're going to say the median is not the message, Bernie. It's the tail. And there is a tail. I know you're plateauing at around 20% in this trial and standard therapy. You're plateauing at like, you know, 10%. So 10% increase in curative fraction. What do you say to that? Yeah, I think I think a lot of this is related to which patients you could get to transplant. Exactly. And not yes. related to inatuzumab. Yeah, that's what I'd say. And the tail, you know, in, in chemo and I know they kind of, they go together and it's hard to show without, you know, visually showing this to the audience, but they basically track until about 15 or so months. Yeah. And then they and split. Then the standard suddenly. arm. Yeah. Yep. Drop suddenly. Well, and that's where the curve separate. Like four people must have had events between 15 yeah. and 20 months. You, you know, it's only more, you know, it can't be more than four <laughs> because there's only, it's, you know, they censored so many people, but there's so many people, there's so yeah. few people left at that time point. We, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but let me ask you this, Bernie, a philosophical question, philosophical question. Mm-hmm. Is the goal of second line ALL therapy to improve a median or is the goal actually, I mean, in this case, w- let me be clear. I do not believe this drug leads to more people being cured. I don't believe it because of all the things we said. You know, if you're going to have, you know, you may be taking more people to transplant. So I'm, I don't believe you've proven that. But let me ask you the philosophical question. Do you want a median, a drug that improves median survival here? Or do you want a drug that improves the tail of the curve? Tail. You want you want to cure these patients. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think... I think the goal in these patients is still cure for yeah. the, the majority of them. Yeah. So y- you are right there. I think looking at the transplant outcomes here yeah. are also very interesting when it comes to side effects. Yeah. Um, so when we talk about VOD with INO, so Let's I agree, you know, maybe you could use INO to get them there. Maybe you could use a different chemo regimen than flag or whatever was given here. Something cheaper um, maybe. Yeah. If you give, yeah, if you give INO, the VOD rate here was was 11%. And then the final follow-up, it was 14%. So this is not a trivial rate of a severe toxicity. And in the patients that went to transplant, there was a 21% rate of VOD. Jeez. That is incredibly high. So I, I would say where, where I use this drug is not in the first relapse setting. If I've got someone who's a transplant candidate and I'm looking for cure because that's, that's our goal here. That's the goal. I, I'm going to give another round of some other chemo first. Or potentially, depending on the next agent we talk about, maybe plenitumumab. But I am not going to give inatuzumab in this setting unless I'm, my back is up against the wall and I have no good options for the patient. You know, then in that case, maybe we try inatuzumab to get them to a transplant. And let me ask you a question. There's going to be someone out there. You know, we've been talking, we've been banding about it like like everyone is aware. But let's say somebody's out there listening and they they have they're not familiar with VOD. So how would you describe VOD? How do you identify it clinically, um, and and um, and and what does it tell you about the biology of what's going on? So, I, I, VOD or veno occlusive disease yeah. is a severe hepatotoxicity yeah. um, that that results when you get you get essentially clogging of the hepatic yeah. sinusoids because of these micro thrombi that occur. And these patients present with horrible ascites, multi organ failure. Um, liver failure and it's it's fairly toxic. And the so billy, we're not talking the billy about, goes through the roof. Yeah, I mean, billy goes through the roof. Yeah. This isn't like, you know, when we talk about hepatotoxicity, usually it's like we tickled the LFTs a little bit yeah. and we freaked out. This is like fatal liver toxicity. And and what is the death rate of? If you have VOD, I mean, it, the fatality rate is like seventy percent, eighty percent, something very high, right? Yeah, it's maybe a little bit lower, but it, again, it depends on the the patient. Right. Um, in the trial, I think like you know, 30% or so were fatal, but that's still like 30% of cases. Yeah, that's a lot. A very that's not select, a trivial side effect. Yeah. It's not a trivial, it's a select, select group of these people. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. Okay. So, so, so now you get you giving me that sense. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, uh, to, to put it all together, uh, the way I would kind of articulate it is, um, you know, 
Um, the drug offers some theoretical advantages over mm -hmm. chemotherapy, uh, particularly because it's an entirely novel mechanism of action. And so you may feel frustrated that you have just failed in giving intensive chemotherapy. Why give more chemotherapy? That's a common mantra among oncologists. So it offers that theoretical advantage. The proof to show that these theoretical bases for a drug actually lead to substantive improvements in outcome is to run a fair randomized trial and just use survival. You don't need all these other surrogates. You just use survival and show a clear benefit. Here, even though they have picked the weakest competitors, even though they've given their drug the advantage by letting you give more of it, or or let me put that another way, by the reality is that more doctors chose to give more of it, so they're giving themselves an extra advantage, mm -hmm. they still can't move the puck one oh, iota yeah. forward on a median OS, and they really are not convincingly proving that they can increase the tail, the cure rate. So, I mean, I, what am I to think? I have to I, think this is not a very effective drug, and it's in good company, it's got like other not very effective uzigamycin drugs. <laughs> it joins them, yeah. I think. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't have said it better. They had a wide open net and they completely missed. Mm. They took a slap shot and missed. Well, they got um, a drug a, approval, it, so they, they won what they wanted. <laughs> they they did win what they wanted. They won the game. Um, now yeah, let's talk I, about Blino. Blin. Blin is the next um, novel agent that we have approved here in ALL. Mm -hmm. This is a, a bispecific T-cell engager or mm -hmm. a bite antibody, mm -hmm. um, which it binds to CD19 mm -hmm. that is present on B cells and then CD3 that's present on T cells and basically brings them together. So it's kind of like playing matchmaker between uh, the malignant B cells in the T cells so that the T cells can then kill the B cells. Mm, it's tinder um, for your, for your blood system. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that, but I love it. Okay. Uh, so Blin, Blin is tinder for, um, ALL um, and, but, but, you know, I heard something that somebody told me that said, you're not supposed to call it bite. Did you hear this? So I think Amgen has like Patented the technology. Bite. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. so Blin, you can call it bite, but all these other things, I think you have to refer to whatever technology they have. Like there's these uh, dual affinity retargeting or dart antibodies. And there's other dia bodies. They're basically two antibodies or portions of antibodies stuck together. I see. Um, I think bite sounds cool. So, I think bite sounds cool. Um, so, so bi specific yeah. T cell engaging. T cell engager. Yeah. yeah. So actually, before the study that you're going to talk to us about, which is another Cantharjan study called Tower, um, mm -hmm. I think Blino, wasn't it initially approved? Oh, it was. It was initially approved based on an uncontrolled study, um, and it got a drug approval, but it was super costly, and it was given inpatient. And, you know, we have very difficult um, reimbursement mechanisms for very costly inpatient medicines. And so it required a special payment from Medicare to really kind of fund. Do you remember this this history? Yeah. So it, it was approved in uh, late 2014. I remember because we had just come back from, from ASH in, yeah. I think it was San Francisco yeah. um, that year. Um, which was very, very fun, Ash. I, I miss uh, the days mm. soon when we can have uh, in-person stuff. Yeah, me too. Um, we'll be back this topic. year, I think. We'll be back this yep. year, my guess. All right, go on. <laughs> but but um, it, we, we came back, and of course, there was a relapsed ALL patient who like imminently needed this drug in December. And yeah. so I remember I, myself and my colleague, we like locked ourselves in our office like near Christmas time, uh, trying to figure out how the heck to give this drug inpatient because not only was the reimbursement an issue because it cost you know you know hundred thousand dollars or some insane amount, but the logistics of giving a continuous infusion at such a low rate in the hospital was a challenge in terms of the pumps, training the nurses, training people not to you know accidentally flush the line and give oh, like yeah. a bolus of blend. It was a disaster. Yes. And then, like let's say you could get people out by day ten or yes. day eleven. Yes. The problem was you had to figure out well you know, who's going to change these bags every 48, 72 hours? Yes. Are we going to get nursing support? It was, it was a disaster. Yes. Um, we eventually figured it out, but I think, um, you know, it was a, it was a huge challenge and you're right. It was based on uh, a phase two study, um, a single arm phase two study. So this is the follow-up to that, this yeah, tower the trial. Study. And the reason I'm, yep. I'm, I know about this is uh, in 2016, Sunkit Druva and I wrote, mm -hmm. um, 
uh, a, a viewpoint in gem oncology called application of Medicare's new technology add-on payment for Blino. Okay. They required a special payment. Um, but and, and and just to refresh my memory, um, you know, the entire pharmacologic reason this is a slow drip is because if you push this really fast and hard, you get CRS like you get with CAR T. Yeah, that's that's part of it. The other issue is the half life is really short. Mm. Um, so because it's not a full antibody, it's just the variable regions attached to each other. Um, it's it has a very short half life of you know maybe hours, right? Um, so it's gone within the body in a couple of hours, and that's a really important point though because if you have CRS with this drug, you just shut off the infusion right. and it's gone. I'm like, you give a dose of steroid or two doses of steroid, the patients do better. You do not need to be whipping out tocilizumab left and right for Blin CRS. It's not the same degree as CAR T CRS. Yes. Um, because it is so reversible. Some of the bite bites or darts or whatever they are being developed now, though, they've engineered to have longer half lives. I see. So attaching more of the antibody to it so they're not cleared as quickly from the serum so you can give you know, these short infusions, which last, you know, weeks at a time instead of continuous infusion for 28 days. I see. I don't think I rec, I don't think I really appreciated that point. That's a good point. So then, so in the bag though, it's stable for, oh, that's also mm -hmm. why you change the bag so frequently because yeah. it's not that stable. And this is another oh. um, interesting point. It was really frustrating when it came out because there was probably some stability data that was longer um, and some stability data from Europe, but trying to get people to coordinate and use the longer stability data, which was never published, you know, you just got it from the, the company was like pulling teeth um, to try to do like seven day bags or, you know, 72 hour bags or longer bags. It was, it was a huge challenge. I see. Fascinating. Okay, go on. Take me, take me through this. <laughs> yeah. So the tower trial randomized patients and this, this study was slightly different from the, the Innovate study in that um, they were a little bit more um, difficult to treat patients, I believe. They weren't just first and second relapse. These could be any any relapse. So they were either refractory to primary induction, first relapse with a very short remission of less than 12 months, or later relapses. So second relapse, third, fourth, fifth, or relapse after transplant. So a little bit harder to treat patients. And I think you'll see that when you see the survival rates in these trials. Um, but they randomized them two to one to BLIN or standard of care chemotherapy. And here the standard of care chemotherapy was maybe slightly better than what we saw in the Innovate study. So it was flag plus or minus an anthracycline. So at least you have the option to pair other drugs with it. HIDAC plus other drugs, you could add asparaginase, vinca, steroids, etoposide. The problem with this is I don't know what people did. You know, this all sounds great. Like theoretically, I would maybe be able to concoct a regimen here, um, but it's hard to, you know, get that information from the trial. Did they actually report um, anywhere the, the specific regimens used? They, they have it in their, um, the, they classify them as flag plus or minus anthracycline, so just so high deck, very vague, base, yeah. this base, whatever. And then they, they say that these regimens could be combined with other drugs. And then they list like a host of other oh, drugs. Sure. Okay. Great. Um, so, mm. but it's, it's, a, it's, Definitely more reasonable, better, but again, better not, than of eight. Yeah. not yeah. ideal. Yeah, okay. we'll say not ideal, but uh, B pl B plus, B plus regimens. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah, and their primary endpoint here was overall survival. They didn't squeeze in CR CRI. Hmm. Um, they defined it correctly in this trial, so a little bit better there. Okay, and so in the trial, I think again we're seeing that. 16% of patients in the blin arm withdrawing consent before even getting treatment, mm. but they're in, they're in this analysis, right? So almost the same rate of patients saying, no, thanks. I don't want these regimens. I'm going to go get something else, mm. um, yes. in this study as mm. well. I see. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I, but I, the survival I, I was, like was yeah. longer. It, okay. It was Let's seven. talk about that. You know what yeah. I'm going to say, but go on. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. I'll, I'll just, I'll just leave you with the numbers and then I'll let you go. So the median survival was 7.7 .7 months versus four months. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a very interesting, uh, pattern to the, the survival curves. 
Yeah, so that's what I'm going to talk about. That's what I wanted to say. So I remember, <laughs> I, I remember where I was where, when I read, read this study. I think I was on leukemia service, and everyone was raving about it. And and it was a, it was like a, it was like Oprah Winfrey and Blino. You get Blino. You get Blino. You get Blino. You get Blino. Everyone's getting Blino. Um, yeah. But the thing that struck me about this is again, you know, for the young person with relapsed ALL, we're talking a 39 year old, a 45 year old, a 51 year old. You know, mm-hmm. a median survival of four to seven months. That's not why they're there. That's not why they're spending no. all those days in the hospital. They're spending it because they think they want you to cure them. And the reality is here, the curves are indistinguishable for like the first two months, three months. And then they meet again at 15 months and they're indistinguishable, you know, into the future. Um, so I guess my point is that, you know, the, the curves separate in the middle of the cur- in the middle of the Gr- Kaplan Meyer. I believe that they do separate, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. there, I do not believe Blino is curing a higher fraction of people that's my question all right uh, that's my question to you do you believe that yeah i agree 100 percent because i think you know whether you give blend whether you give i know these responses are not durable yeah um a, a lot of the long-term outcomes in these patients has to do we think with getting them to transplant <laughs> exactly. when they're in this relapse refractory setting so i i i agree with you i, I don't think there's much difference in the long-term cure rates in these regimens and so i think that is one uh, sort of limitation to these results. Kind of where I see the biggest issue is um, is in how people interpret the data more than whether I think this is active. I think it is an active yes, drug. I agree. And there is a place for it. Yeah. But I think that the way that people interpret this study is problematic. Um, so one of the things that um, I think they did is they broke down responses by you know a bunch of different you know baseline characteristics. And if you have a a low disease burden, blast percentage less than 50%, they respond fairly well. Their their CR, CRI rate is high. You know, it's like 65%. But if their their blast percentage was above 50%, you're looking at a CR, CRI rate that looks, you know, as bad as the comparator was 34%, which we talked about earlier. If you give these patients, you know, real BFM reinduction or something, it's much better than that. Right. So it does not work that well in high disease burden. But then they also broke out outcomes by first line, second line, and then third line therapy. And then they actually, they also published this separately. They said, if you give Blin in first line, outcomes look better than if you give it in second or third line. (laughs) So conclusion, you should give Blin in the front line setting because of Of course they say that, right? Oh, crazy. Which you cannot say that from this study. Like, yes, obviously in the first line setting, the drug looks better. But Selection to bias. say that yeah. you ha- you have to give Blin in the other arm yes. when they relapse, yeah. and that's a huge problem with with saying that. So I think people waste Blin because of studies like that in the first relapse setting when they have a packed marrow, because you know they hear that from people or they read that study that says it has best activity first line, so I give it first line. Yeah, and when you could have just given chemotherapy. And your point is you probably get a higher resp- um. C- CR rate. But let me make one point yeah. here. In, in this study, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and in Innovate, mm-hmm. um, you know, as they did the study, the CR rates were higher. Uh, they say that, you know, I don't dispute that. that. As they did it, we can we can debate the control arm was, you know, could have been done, they could have done better, but their CR rates were higher. Their CRI rates were higher. Um, that means that they can take more people to transplant. Fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. Despite the fact that they can take more people to transplant, they still are not able to cure a higher fraction of people. So one of the arguments I always hear in the leukemia space is, you know, yes, the drug doesn't have an OS benefit, but, you know, by getting more and deeper remissions, you can take more people to that curative step and then you're going to have more cures. But my point is that if that were true, you would see that in the tail of the curve and you don't see it. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think it, I think it depends on when you use the drug. Okay. So I, I think it, I think this drug has activity, but it, it doesn't have activity in a high disease burden patient. And so in someone with a high disease burden, your typical ALL relapse, there is absolutely no difference. And like you said, in the curves, there's no difference in the amount of people you're going to get to transplant in those patients with low disease burden. The response rates are very high. Could you still get them to there with, um, with chemotherapy? Probably. 
Yeah, but Bernie, so, my question to you is, if, if you have low disease burden, what's the CRI rate, CR rate from it's chemo? It's much higher. Yeah, okay. I totally agree. Okay. So where we use this yes. in practice is first relapse, whether it's, you know, Blin or thinking of Blin or I know, we give chemo first. Okay. So first relapse, there is no data to say that any of these targeted-ish therapies are better than just standard chemotherapy reinduction. And so if you're in first relapse, we will give you chemo and try to take you to a transplant. If you fail that and you have a low disease burden, I think that's the place for blinitumumab. If you fail that and have a high disease burden, I think that's maybe where you need to use inotuzumab. Okay. That's, that's, um, that's quite reasonable. That's quite reasonable. Um, and, and to be honest, I mean, uh, there, there, there is a, there's a never conducted hypothetical randomized study right in the third line setting that one could yep. someday do. Um, but, but you know, that's, that's really where you use it. I think that's very fair to use it. I mean, and to be honest, by the time you get to that setting, um, you know, there's very few people out there and, and there's not yeah. a lot of great options. Um, okay. Um, now before, before we all run out of all, all time, um, but you know, you I want to talk about blend yeah, for MRD. That's what I, exactly. Yeah. I want to okay. talk about blend for MRD. Yeah. Um, let's talk about blast the blast trial yeah yeah so this this trial actually i think started it rolling and maybe had results before um the phase three trial yeah um so we kind of knew about this going in but this was a an open lab label single arm phase two study you know not surprised right the gold standard the gold standard <laughs> in cancer is the phase two study. Uh, open All these trainees single. are going to be so confused. Yeah, right. Well, I guess but, uh, I'll be very clear. Uh, it's not the gold standard. Um, <laughs> you know, randomized, blinded, randomized controlled trials with with without tons of dropout. When you find out what you got, that now that that's a, so the gold standard is to not have lots of dropout when you get randomized. Yep. Um, and an uncontrolled study like this, um, you know, often there's more questions than answers. Um, that's really yep. the challenge yeah and here i think is the ultimate yeah, example exactly. of that yeah where you have patients who um so in in all to kind of explain for the audience um you can look morphologically whether disease is present but to see whether there are small amounts of disease you can do what's called minimal residual disease or measurable residual disease testing via um, flow cytometry or sensitive pcr methods and there are differing cutoffs of what is the right cutoff of MRD, but in general, you want a level of um, less, you want a sensitivity of one in 10,000 cells and not detecting any blast with that sensitivity. So 10 to the minus four. Um, so in this study, they took patients who were getting um, chemotherapy, who were in hematologic remission, but still had minimal residual or measurable residual disease but this was pretty high MRD. This was greater than 10 to the minus three. So this was, you know, one in a thousand cells, they saw disease. Um, but this was after a minimum of three intensive blocks of chemotherapy. And I think that's a huge point in the study. So to be enrolled on this trial, you had to be getting chemotherapy via, you know, maybe it's a, a German protocol or hyper CVAD or whatever it was you had to get three intensive blocks of chemotherapy and have not relapsed or had anything bad happen to you for those entire three months before you were enrolled on this trial. Wait, wait, and, and so, let me put it another way. Not only did you have to get that therapy and not have anything bad happen, but you also had to get that therapy and not achieved MRD negativity. Right, right. <laughs> you gotta right. be, you have to be basically like in this like, um, you know. Smoldering um, phase. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You gotta be in this yeah. like, this Goldilocks zone, uh, yeah. you know, where you've neither achieved the, d the deep remission, <laughs> nor have you had recurrent disease, which is a very, you know, narrow band. Right, right. So you had high MRD, but you were not, blasting off and right, relapsing. Right. And in this study, they gave, so these were patients with pretty high MRD and they gave patients blinitumumab and they had a 78% um, MRD complete response. Um, to me, that's the only outcome. You know, they show a bunch of survival curves, which I think mostly just confuse people because a lot of times it just looks like you're comparing one to another. But, you know, oftentimes these survival curves are like MRD responders versus non-responders or event-free survival and overall survival, right? And it just kind of confuses uh, everybody. 
So I guess, um, you know, we're so much on the same wave, wavelength. Um, in 2018, when this approval came out, Talal Halal and I wrote for Nature Reviews Clinical Oncology. It's called Eliminating MRD, the FDA's approval of Blino for BALL mm -hmm. and complete remission. And our first point, of course, was that we actually don't have standardized metrics, at least at the time, for MRD measurement. And so they use sensitivity of 10 to the power of minus 4. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, people debate that. The next point we made was exactly the point you're saying right now. The trial leading to accelerated approval used an analysis of survival by tumor response. In other yeah. words, they compare outcomes in those who respond versus who don't respond. We say, quote, the practice of comparing survival of responders, those achieving undetectable MRD, and non-responders in a single arm, non-randomized study is biased in favor of responders and might reflect inherent differences in biology between groups rather than an effect of the investigational agent. This type of analysis should not be used to imply causality. This is a classic fallacy in oncology. That was our second point. Classic fallacy. Classic, classic fallacy. Yeah. And you know they're, they're fooling everybody because everybody oh, yeah. don't know that. I know. I know. And, and this has become standard of care oh my um, god don't say that to me bernie oh, don't say oh, that this, to me this is standard of care no! but if you i think the problem is people will look at these curves which look great and also i love how stretched out the survival I curves know. are by the way <laughs> i actually it looks like someone sat on them yeah. but i actually tried to you know superimpose that curve on other transplant outcomes in patients with mrd positive disease because my question was if you have mrd positive disease th at this level what do your outcomes look like if you go to transplant? And the outcomes are all over the map. There is no right answer. Sometimes transplant looks great. Sometimes it looks considerably worse than Blinn. But I think the problem here is in all of these analyses, we're comparing um, patients who made it these three months with this huge immortal time bias compared to these other studies. And you you can't do that. Like we we need a randomized trial to see whether this actually improves outcomes. In addition, two thirds of these patients went on to transplant after. And there's a lot of talk of, well, if I make them MRD negative now, I don't need to take them to transplant. Oh. This isn't a study of blend. This is a study of blend plus transplant. Exactly. This is both. Okay. And so, it looks pretty good, yeah. but you know what? Show me a randomization to something else. Let me, I, let me quote to you, Bernie, from 2018, from Talal in my paper. Quote, <laughs> randomized trials are needed to ensure that this hypothesis is true and to determine whether treating patients with MRD in order to achieve undetectable MRD will provide benefit to patients. Um, I think you're right. You're so right. And then the other thing I would say is that, you know, one of the greatest fallacies in oncology, whether it's MRD or pathologic complete response or any one of these uh, novel um, low burden disease surrogates is the following. 100% true. If you achieve MRD negativity, you do better than if you don't. Totally true. Mm -hmm. If you achieve PATH-CR negativity, you do better than when you don't. Totally true. Mm -hmm. But the question that is still open, if you take someone who wasn't going to be PATH-CR negative, who was PATH-CR positive, and you flip him to PATH-CR negative, do they have the same outcome as someone who is already PATH-CR negative from the outset? If you take someone who's MRD positive and you flip him to MRD negative with more Blino, do they have the same outcome as somebody who is MRD negative without needing that extra treatment? And the answer is, that's a very different question. They may not have the same outcome. They may have a far inferior outcome. So you can't, you know, you can't use these kind of transitive property. MRD negative good, Blino give MRD negative, therefore Blino good. You can't play totally that agree. game. You got to prove that that strategy helps. And your point about transplant is so true, which is if you're going, you know, you need to prove that this drug very costly, you know, and it's an inconvenience to people. I mean, these people, yeah. many of them are going to die. They don't want to spend their time in the hospital getting this drug. They don't want this pump. Um, it's an inconvenience. You have to prove that it provides them that benefit. You cannot do that with a non-randomized study. Totally, totally agree. I think another thing that's kind of scary, and and I think this is sort of a, a negative implication of this becoming standard of care, is people are slowly moving this up in therapy mm, because course. you know there's no rule from the FDA or the approval that says you know give three intensive chemo blocks before exactly. you give this, and so there are patients who will become MRD negative. You know, seventy percent. A lot of patients will become MRD negative just with further therapy, yes. and don't necessarily need this therapy. And it's possible by giving Blin, which we know actually doesn't work so well for CNS disease, doesn't work so well for extra medullary disease. You are missing out on two to three cycles of intensive chemotherapy to give this drug. 
that's a huge stretch based on no data to do that to a patient. So and I, I, yeah. I think this is dangerous how I'll, people I'll just, are applying this. I'll just add to what you're saying. You know, um, this is something that people do not understand in oncology, which is that sometimes more options can erode and not yes. enhance standard of care. Because what exactly. you do is you, sh- you show doctors a new, shiny, sexy thing, and they naturally want to use it more and earlier and sooner. But they may pull it into a space where it actually does the patient a disservice because they've been better off with the older treatment, as you point out rather eloquently about the 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 the, the certain uh, sites of disease that this is not a great drug for and people will not see that they will never catch that or detect that it's a huge threat i think it's a threat that you know we've written about for um colonoscopies they create some blood-based test that's not nearly as good and then of course there's somebody out there who was gonna get the colonoscopy but they get the blood-based test instead their outcome is not enhanced it's eroded you know you only think about the person who wouldn't get a colonoscopy Mm -hmm. who gets the blood test you don't think about the person who's switching their decision the other way same with this you might give them right so you see my point totally agree okay bernie we did a lot we Um, did a lot (laughs) okay here's my 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 last question for you um, how, how come, how come, how come you see all these things and nobody, uh, you're, I mean, you're really good. I mean, you're really good at this stuff. You're really good. What's your background? Where did you, where did you go to college? Where did you go to pharmacy school? When did you start to get into this stuff? So I, um, I'm from the Michigan area, Detroit area. Um, I went to U of M for undergrad and then, mm. um, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know if I wanted to you know, go into medicine or, or, or do research. I was working in a, a transplant immunology lab doing benchtop research. Um, so it's always been a sort of passion of mine. And then I got an email from the, you know, the Dean of pharmacy, Dean Perry at the time, mm-hmm. um, who was, who's fantastic. Um, and, and, and it was like top 10 reasons to go to pharmacy school. And mm-hmm. I was like, Oh, I don't check that out. And, uh, I just jumped into it because I thought, you know, I could do research. I could do clinical practice. This is great. And Michigan's College of Pharmacy really focuses on um, evidence-based medicine. And I I remember rotating with some of my preceptors and seeing, you know, that they were able to influence decisions. And that's kind of what pushed me to continually sort of question things. And I think it's also a product of who I work with. You know, I I have a team of of clinical pharmacists that I work with in, in oncology and Anthony Parasinati and Lydia Benitez and Allison Shepherds and others, these great pharmacists who push me, you know, if, if I want to give a therapy, they ask why, you know, what's the data for that? Um, we push each other and the physicians do the same thing. Um, the, the physicians at Michigan are, are very open to changing their minds based on what the data shows. And I think that's how they were taught as well. And so when you have two groups of people that you know, they want to do what's best for, for patients based on the data, you know, by, by sending each other figures and graphs and stuff and <laughs> like the emails, I think it makes everyone better because we, we push each other to, um, to not accept the status quo. And I, and I think we need to do that. We need to have more, you know, well done trials and we need to, we need to push for these things. Otherwise we're going to be stuck in the same place of having, a bazillion single arm phase two studies and everyone using the therapies because someone told them it was the next greatest thing. It's well put. You know, I only booed your Michigan because I went to Michigan state, my friend. I went <laughs> I to know state. That. <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, a, I'm a true blue Michigan fan, but you know, now we're a basketball school, so it's, uh, it's okay. <laughs> but, um, but I think, um, you know, I, I think you're doing a great job. I mean, our uh, um, you know, I learned a lot from our discussion and I learned a lot from the last one and we're going to do another one on something so I can learn some more. Um, and, um, and I think you're right in a number of respects. I mean, one, I think you're right on all the specific points. Um, the second thing I think is I, 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 I'm not as good as you in this space, my friend, I've only found like 60% of the Easter eggs you found, you know, by that, I mean, (laughs) I only myself was only able to pick up about 60% of these limitations, not a hundred percent. And that is a product of the fact that, um, you're good. You're good at what you do. Um, and then the third thing I would say is there's a lesson here for the trainees. The lesson is you got to be like Bernie. You got to be, <laughs> you got to read articles like this. It's a very different way he's reading. He's not reading this article and then going on Twitter and parroting the takeaway point and, and praising all the investigators for a job well done for a manuscript they may or may not have written. By the way, as a medical writer, probably wrote it. Um, <laughs> that's not the way to read articles. You got to one, 
Think about, really think hard. If you had the people who are enrolled in this study in your clinic, in your practice, in your hospital, how would you treat those people? And if the answer is you wouldn't give them anything remotely like the control arm of that, of that trial, you need to know that and say that. The next thing, once you start the treatment, are they getting all the treatments according to the schedule you would give them? Are they getting all the appropriate other types of drugs? Um, so I think that's one of the core questions. The next thing, are they measuring the outcome the way you measure it? You know, the point that I didn't pick up on, um, Innovate, they're not measuring CRI the same way. The same definition is not being used. So that's important, and that's really important for cross trial comparisons. I think there are a few lessons that you'd hit on that everyone just needs to be aware of, and I'll just say a few of them. One, Historically controlled studies are notoriously inaccurate. They're upwardly biased. They're biased for a few mm -hmm. reasons. There's a selection bias. There's a temporal bias. As time goes on, things get better. So a study done yep. in the last five years is going to be better than 19 diggity two at MD Anderson. Of course it is. Even if the drugs were the same drug given on the same schedule, it's going to be better. We get better over time. So these historical controls, and you don't have to believe me, these they're empirical studies of this. That's one. Two, um, the selection bias. You made an excellent point. You got to think about who is being selected for this therapy. And and uh, the BLAST study, I think, mm -hmm. highlights that very nicely. You, It's really like landing the Apollo spacecraft back on Earth. There's a tiny <laughs> window you got to hit. And you got to get all this treatment, not have explosive disease, nor d achieve a, a deep MRD negative remission. You have to be in between. That's a very yep. special group. And the reason it matters is the moment you extrapolate results to people not in that cohort, you you have not a leg to stand on, my friend. You have no data at all. Um, so I think that's the second point. The third point is there's no one who's an advocate for older and cheaper medicines. No one is an advocate for that. No one is giving lectures on that. No one is telling you about that. But older and cheaper medicines are often the best choice for your patient. Um, Bernie Marini, it's been a pleasure to talk to you as always. I think this is a great overview of ALL, which is one of those leukemias that, to be honest, there are a lot of people who don't spend a lot of time managing it on the outpatient side, and they're not always familiar with the incredibly complicated regimens, but it's important to know these fundamentals. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for, for having me on the podcast. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here, and you know I always learn from your podcasts, and they're always uh, great entertainment on the way to work. <laughs> Thank you so much. You've been listening to Season 3 of Plenary Session. Plenary Session is produced by Kiana Klossner. Music by Ian Straley and Audrey Tran. The views expressed on Plenary Session are those of whoever said it and no one else. Plenary Session is not medical advice. Follow us on Twitter at plenary underscore session. Until next time. <laughs>